Hey, good afternoon and welcome to uh, Fire Engineering Hub Day Hangout with the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. One of the first times I haven't stumbled through that name. Um, and tradition is training. And of course, we've got the Godfather on, Bobby Halton with us today. And we've got a good group, man. It's a, it's a pretty large group. The, the fire service instructors uh, definitely uh, went to bat today and got us a bunch of people on. And that's always a good thing. But hey, so uh, before we even start talking about, you know, our topic today, uh, obviously, we just all of us are still uh, jet lagged and beat up from Bobby and I got yelled, we got yelled at for, you know, like a half an hour on Wednesday. And then Dan yelled and Doug yelled. So I'm tired of getting yelled at. So what are you going to yell us about today there, Chief Halton? <laughs> Tell I us what you. happened out there last I, week. I, I, I hate scenes. you. No, it's, uh, it's, well, I'm sorry I yelled at everybody, but uh, um, it's all good. I, 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 I thought Sharp and your, I thought Dan and Doug were amazing. Uh, Dave Page was fascinating. And then Frank Viscuso, what a gentleman, what a, what a, what a great lineup of speakers. It was really just a pleasure to be there and, and hear them all. Um, but, but to a, to a, to a larger point, it was nice to be back and hear everybody, you know, just talking fire everywhere you went, you know what I mean? You, whether you were sitting down at breakfast, whether you're sitting down at dinner, whether you were, you know, just bumping into somebody in the hall, it's like, Hey, what's going on? You know, what are you doing? But you know, we're doing this We you know, we, we just bought that, or we had to look at our scheduling or, you know, we changed this or, you know, we're, we're recruiting or we're having this issue or having that issue. I thought it was fascinating. And, and I, it was an amazing, what was amazing to me was the amount of emoting that was going on. In other words, everyone, because of the human condition and no disrespect to this format here, this is great for broadcasting. This is great for television, if you will, what we used to call it in my day, you know, this is great for having a conversation, but there's nothing like, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. there's nothing like, you know, sitting down across the table. There's nothing like, you know, pulling up a couple of chairs in the corner of the room and, or, or, or being in a classroom with somebody to be able to stop and say, ask a question. And there were so many great presentations, whether it was from the uh, John Bilch talking about stress and neuroscience, or whether it was talking about, you know, flow rates from Kirk Allen and, and, and pump panel operations. It was just everywhere you went, rooms were full. Everybody was excited. Uh, the outside activities were just amazing. The, the Fool's Bash was just a super time. The, uh, the union party was, uh, uh, all of them were larger than they'd ever been ever in the history of FDIC. And I think it was just because it, the, we're back to normal and everybody's excited to be back to normal. And, and so I wanted to say thank you to everyone who participated. But the other reason I want to come on, and I apologize, I have to leave a little early because I, unlike the rest of these guys, I've got a full-time job. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, I have a full-time job also. And one of my big bosses scheduled a meeting at 1230. So I've got to get ready for it and um, after action and planning and all that good stuff. So um, I did want to tell, let everybody know that the call for presentations is open. And we were just discussing it before we went live on air. If you haven't taught at FDIC and you would like to, the most surefire way to get your foot in the door is to write a brief article. And remember, we are interested in everything and anything that has to do with the fire service. And we're particularly interested in how you did it or how you believe we should do it. You know, opinions are everywhere. If you want opinions, there's plenty of blog places to blog. But in fire engineering, we want to look at, well, here's an issue, you know, and say it's staffing, say it's a, say, say it's a staffing for a growth. Okay, here's the issue. Here's what we did, or here's what you could do, or here's, here's some options. Here's the reasons why. Here's how you evaluate it, right? So if you look at the problem, then how, how did you respond to it? How did you evaluate it? What was, and what, did, what do you want it to look like if you're, if, you, if you're successful, right? In other words, just saying that you want to get, you know, better staffing or have, why? What's the, what would it look like if you're successful? And, and even today's topic, we're talking to be talking about the incident commander and the company officer and how to integrate better on the fire ground, uh, you know, in, in emergency situations, Okay, so what should that look like, like in your organization if it's successful? Because what's what's going to work in Bipperville and Bopperville is different than Kipperville and Copperville, right? We're a very parochial uh, profession, and that that's not good or bad. That's actually fantastic because Tip O'Neill was right. He said government that's closest to the people is is the best form of government because you're most responsive to that community. So your fire department should 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 be malleable enough so that it meets the needs of the community that it exists in, right?
like the FDNY would do really poorly in Minot, North Dakota, <laughs> because they just wouldn't have any work to begin with. They, they, but I mean, it's a freezingly cold place with isolated populations. You need a, you need a department there that's more spread out. That's, that's, that's more um, agrarian uh, for lack of a better word. But, uh, but, but that, that's just not right or wrong or good or bad. And I'm not putting down the FDNY. I'm not putting down Minot, North Dakota, but it's just a very rural spot. Right. So they're, their needs and their 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 demands are going to be very different. You know, demand is out in Oakland. It's very different from rural Oklahoma. You know, you've got guys and gals on the call from the St. Louis area, Chief Silvernail. Very different, very different region than Miami Dade. Very different region than Bangor, Maine. And, and and so you you want to look at things locally first. Always locally first. We we respond to you know the, my talk this year was you were worth it and. and it, it, it really is about that individual who calls us. It's about that person. It's, it's, not, it's not some vague them. It's not some collective you know, community. It, it's about that poor person having the heart attack or that poor person whose house is on fire or that individual who just had a car wreck. It's about that person, that one person. Your whole world suddenly shifts to that one person. And, and that's what your tactics are about. It's searching for life. It's trying to save people's property. And sometimes, you know, we focus on the McMansions, we focus on the warehouse storage places, we focus on the high rises. But when you think about it, you know, if you can save a few possessions out of a double wide, or somebody who's living in a, you know, 900 square foot shotgun, that's all they got, you know, and then recovering, when folks with limited, limited income are forced to recover, it's a lot harder than somebody who is, you know, well healed, like I am, you know, it's, it's, Who's, who's got insurance, who's got, you know, you have to remember that sometimes it's about underwear and medicine. You know what I mean? Because, you, you know, I, I, and, and all the guys on the, you know, it's all guys on the call. So most of us will wear our, our jeans two or three days in a row. My wife hates that. She's like, you wore those yesterday. I'm like, yeah, but they're still pretty clean. You know what I mean? But you always change your underwear. And, and my, my uncle George once told me, he said, that's about dignity. He really did. He, my uncle George was a New York City fireman, and he said, you, 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 "That's dignity." And and if you're really poor, you can't go out and buy, you know, ten new sh- sets of underwear the next day. You, you you know, so if you can save people's undershorts and medicine, you can change their lives. And and so, FDIC, we're looking for, and fire engineering, we're looking for everything, and EMS also. You know, we we brought in a ton of uh, fire rescue content into FDIC this year, and it was extremely well received. I mean, the only point we do extrication is to get the body out of the car. The only reason we go into burning buildings is to pull people out, and then we save their property. But we 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 first search for life. You know, we 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 don't search for the underwear first. We search for the people first, and it, it, so. Uh, you know, all of that matters. And, and so it was really exciting to see the gems games where they had a really fantastic, they had a collapse scenario and they had a firefighter who suffered an electrocution. They had another person who was having an asthmatic at- attack based upon the, the debris. And it was just amazing because the entire audience was filled with, you know, EMTs and paramedics and firefighters, you know, that were EM- cross-trained people. And, and everybody was riveted to watching the men and women compete in that event. And it was phenomenal. So I know I've gone on for far too long. Uh, please go to FDIC.com, put in your call for presentations. If you want to increase your chances, you know, get us a short article about what you're doing or what, 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 what impassions you. Um, we can't thank you enough for your support. Everything matters. Uh, you know, everything there's, there's no, there's, there's no small stuff in the fire service. There just isn't. That's a great book. If you're a CPA or a, librarian or, you know, and no disrespect to CPAs and librarians, but I mean, in the fire service, there is no small stuff because it all matters. So please, you know, think about writing. We'd love to have you. Um, we're so grateful for y'all. Um, we're extremely grateful to Ricky and, and uh, the, the Institute of uh, Fire Service Instructors. If you're not a member, please think about joining. It's a great organization. You know, contact Brian. Um, he'll be happy to, to fill you in. Who... I, 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 Chief Silvernail, are you going to allow him to travel to FDIC for 2023 to speak? I think I'm, th- I'm thinking about it. I, you know, I'm kind of on the fence. 
<laughs> but Brian, Brian will be doing one of the, the, the one of the main talks at FDIC next year. He'll be one of our keynoters. So uh, looking forward to hear, hearing what Brian has to share. So that that'll be phenomenal. Um, we're going to have um, Brian Brush, uh, the rescue project, and we're going to also have Dan Sheridan from FDNY and and a and a, and a, a second round draft pick to be named later. So we've got one slot still open. So, um, and I've got a few uh, names with, that we're kicking around. So thank you so much. Um, and, and I'll go away now. So <laughs> Ricky, I'll turn the show back over to you. Okay. Sounds good. I mean, uh, I think everybody had a great time. It was, uh, uh, I got there a little late for a uh, dance thing and I was shocked that it was standing room and there wasn't an open seat in the house. Obviously you were leading that off, but, um, you know, it's just, it's great to see full hallways and a lot of people. So that, that was great. So, um, the, I, I guess, uh, we'll kind of jump into the topic or, you know, a little bit back quarter after, but, um, so I, I kind of wanted to hit on this, uh, because I think this is kind of a, a piece that gets lost, lost sometimes on the fire ground is that, um, you know, the incident commander has a duty to that company officer and what that company officer needs. And, um, obviously I'll hit Brian, uh, Mr. Simmons, uh, Jim and Aaron for uh, a little bit and Roger, but I wanted to start with Josh and Josh, I'm going to have to throw you in the mix here. Cause you know, obviously, you know, when we, when COVID hit and you had just started doing your presentation on a, uh, uh unfortunate line of duty death where you're part of a, a writ activation. Um, you know, so, you know, you know, we talked, you know, in that program, you know, that's on YouTube. Uh, you can go to our website. Obviously, Josh has a, also Howard County does a great program each year uh, for uh, Nathan Flynn uh, to uh, honor his commitment to training. And they uh, they have that on YouTube. So you can download some of that. But, you know, when we're talking about that incident commander, we'll go to the extreme with, jo you know, with Josh and then kind of bring it back with, you know, Roger and and MacArthur if he gets back from a run. But is uh, what, you know. What are you looking for for, you know, like, you know, Chief Heller or myself, you know, Chief Silvernail, what, what are you looking for, uh, for us, you know, when you're when you're inside the building, you know, battling the fire, you know, in zero visibility, and we're sitting outside in our heated and air-conditioned Tahoes, uh, you know, talking to you on the radio. So that, you know, that was my my thing for today, so. Yeah, um, man, you're throwing me right to the wolves right at the gate. Yeah, I know I was. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's funny. I had a couple things. Um outlined a couple of the big topics that come to mind for me and given our line of duty woodscape a little bit of a nod there um two things really come to mind uh one of them is for the for that incident commander to not become task saturated uh, we go back to that at the time we had much of a uh, blue card command driven style compared to a um, orders driven model and there's a time and a place for both. Absolutely. If there's going to be that time when that incident commander needs to be strong, kind of rein things back in and provide some clear direction with clear expectations. But I think there's also a time when that incident commander is going to get too involved. They're going to get a little too far in the weeds and the general orders, hopefully that you have in place, or maybe it's, maybe it's just a strong culture and discipline in place is going to be the thing that's going to dictate actions throughout the incident. And we've seen it where <clears throat> that incident commander, they're ordering where water supply is being directed to, um, what hydrants are going to be getting picked up, what lines are going to what floors. And the more that continues when bad things start to happen, and now the expectation is that incident commander is directing all the little pieces. Uh, we've seen that our officers are becoming uh, less autonomous. Now they're looking for direction from that incident commander when we need to have these free thinking individuals on the scene to be able to go in and make the problem go away. So um, there are some like high stress addresses in our, in our um, jurisdiction as in any jurisdiction where, where we need to have those incident commanders to have a strong presence, stage everybody out. Maybe they have a better, more intimate knowledge of what's going on and like, Hey, Things are rapidly evolving. I need to assign things as they come. But by and large, it's not, that shouldn't be standard operating procedure. So to have them not get in the weeds, have our officers do what they're paid to do, you know, and make the decisions. Because when bad things happen, that that 
command officer is just going to get too far down there. They're saturated and they're going to become overwhelmed. And then you have all these officers on scene looking for direction and things are too spun up. Um, so yeah, that was definitely one of them. And then what comes along on the heels of that would be, um, I'm looking for a command officer that is not going to be that checkbox officer. So there are times when I'm getting transmissions out and I, I can tell just by the way they're talking to me that they're not paying a whole lot to the, the incident scene. They're taking notes on their tax sheet and, you know, Hey, 15 minutes hit, I'm doing a par check. You know, I'm, I'm getting my accountability report. We still have things rapidly evolving and we're trying to make things happen and create change. Um, and again, when bad things happen, they're going to divert to the command sheet and they're sitting there checking boxes and making sure they're hitting all these benchmarks and they're actually not really paying attention to the scene, the crew accountability, and the actual needs and resources of the units on the interior. So, um, and man, that can be a deep dive in and of itself there on that one. So, um, yeah, I just threw out two big ones. Uh, I know we're kind of tight on time. I think I've taken up enough time with that. Like I said, just those two alone, I think um, we can get really spun up on and, and, and go down a rabbit hole. But probably two of the biggest clearing things would be that. Don't let the command officer be test saturated and don't let him be a checkbox officer. Ricky, I'd love to follow up on that. Sure, sure. Go ahead. So, Josh, I can't agree more with you on the whole task saturated. When I was a battalion chief, you know, I wanted to be basically a traffic cop to make sure that my companies were doing what they're supposed to do on the standard operating guideline. You know, there's, a, there's always this big argument of, you know, should you be standard operating guideline driven or should you be command driven, you know, from the guy in the front yard? There's a reason why in World War II, you know, we directed our turrets at the bridges of the Japanese because once you took that out, the boats would float, uh, you know, aimlessly. I believe 100 percent that are, you know, we put these captains in these roles because they are the ones who should understand, you know, what happens in, in the standard operating guideline, how it flows. Um, but you're right. A lot of these organizations get so task saturated that they want to think and get too micromanaged within the standard operating or on the fire ground. And uh, man, that's a big one for me. You know, if you, if you can if you can get your battalion, and that's it's all beforehand. If you know your battalion, like the back of your hand, like you should as a command officer, you should know their capabilities and understand, you know, they should be ready to go and know the standard operating guideline. Um, you know, and nothing, nothing is, 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 is more beautiful when you're sitting in that front yard, you're watching these companies come in and they're doing exactly the standard operating guideline. Now, if you see something wrong or see something, you know, if you got to call an audible, that's a great time. But um, yeah, a hundred percent, Josh, thanks for bringing that up. All right. So, you know, we'll go, I'll go down, you know, once again, we'll get a, a line officer and then we'll either, you know, jump back to, um, you know, Chief Heller or, or Brian or whatever. So, uh, you know, if you don't know, Roger Stager is, uh, you know, uh, in the city of Baltimore, obviously uh, they've been in the news a lot lately. I mean, good God, you guys tried to burn down the city again the other day. Were you actually working Roger or were you, you know, watching from afar? Uh, I was home. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> But I mean, I didn't so go back door yesterday, I went in yesterday. So I got gotcha. you. So, but I mean, obviously, you know, since uh, you know that the the first quarter of this year, you know, as, as things in the Baltimore City Fire Department evolved, and uh, you know, obviously with the tragic line of duty death of those three of the three firefighters on uh, Stricker Street. So I mean, you know, you're that company officer now. What is the interaction between you and the on scene incident commanders now? Um, you know, and what do you need from them? Because obviously I listen to, you know, I listen to a lot of Baltimore fires and, and hear the chitter chatter back and forth. So, but you're inside the building. I'm not. So. I think a lot of it is uh, taking your normal companies and your normal battalion chiefs into account more. So it's uh, trust and mutual respect along with uh, sound tackled tactical decision-making on both parts. So it's the chief always kind of stresses on the company officers and, the guys on what they're doing, have, whether it be SOP or command driven, whatever, but that it's always more or less sometimes one sided. We give reports from inside out, but as the, the inside crews, we're also looking for those reports from the outside in, uh, more so than just the 
to stand or evacuate the building or whatever, give condition updates as a command officer from time to time too. So we understand from my perspective, especially in like a row home situation, if I'm pushing through fire on the first floor, knocking it, and I don't see it traveling up the stairs or whatever else, I'm going to check for extension, but as a command officer, hey, you have fire coming out of the, the scuttle on the roof or from the rear of the second floor indicating that we need to get up there. Any whether so conditions as well as any kind of structural issues, uh, that's where the sound tactical presence, like Josh was talking about, really comes to place. If you're telling you're starting to see it push through the bricks or anything, then, okay, I can couple that with what I'm seeing on the inside. But on the other aspect is with the smoke condition inside, I may not see any of those conditions. So that'll help me make my decision. Okay, hey, we're a little deep. He's saying it's, it's this or that from the outside. We have that respect. And I know he, he's looking out for me. Okay, let's, it's time to come outside or change our game plan or whatever the case may be. All right, Aaron, do you want to follow that up or? Yeah, um, those, Roger's points, Josh's points, Chief Silvernail's points, right on really where I think we're all on the same page. Uh, I, when, I was, when I was a captain, um, I wanted the Chiefs to give me the info from outside the same way I needed to give them the info from the inside. Uh, the crystal ball just rarely works at the command post. And, you know, the more, the more information we both have, I felt the better the exchange, the better decisions we were both going to make, both the Chiefs and us as interior officers. So uh, I, I appreciate those comments a lot. And I think, you know, Roger's living that every day, so he knows it. A um, couple things I, I see, especially from maybe less experienced officers where they'll get into that, as Josh said, checking the boxes, basically. You know, they went to Blue Carter, they went, they took some, you know, ICS, they got their three and 400 or whatever it is. And they're going to sit there, you know, basically the clipboard chief. And for the most part in the fire service, clipboard chiefs aren't usually the most successful and in our area aren't usually the most respected. So there, there has to be that level of flexibility um, that you can be the IC who has to keep everything dialed in and, and as tight as possible, but also the flexibility to use your senses and, and get a good feeling of what you're seeing, smelling, hearing, you know, just reading the building, reading the reading. I listened to Mo Davis talk at, at the Joey D conference a few weeks ago. And one of the things Mo was talking about was he likes being on the front lawn because he can look in a guy's eyes and see what's going on with some of his officers as he's sending them in. And I've always felt that same way that, that it, it gave me that flavor for what was going on. Maybe that's because I was a company officer so long and I always got that, but it, it just, there's a time to be in your buggy there's a time to be tied to a command board, and then there's a time to be on the front lawn or the sidewalk. And I think experienced chiefs know how to manage those. And with good, strong SOPs and trust in the companies in their districts or their divisions, it all seems to flow a lot easier to me. Um, so I, I think that's where, we're, where it is for me. With us, it, it, the, the staffing levels changed. So now our operation has changed a little bit. Um, so we have to be more flexible as officers that way. So it's, it's just that constant movement of we have to be able to adjust to what's going on. And, and in most communities now, it's not just a bedroom community or just an industrial community. We have so much from large industrial, large commercial to, you know, the high rises to final villages, so to speak, of houses. So I think you treat the fires depending on what's in front of you, depending on the situation and your response protocols, you, you just can't get locked into being that clipboard fire chief. And we're just going to check the box at every call, but there's got to be flexibility. And, and I think that just comes with knowing your organization and mutual aid and everything that comes with it. All right, chief. Well, I uh, plan to go like between company officers and chief, but apparently the citizens of the district of Columbia needed MacArthur more than, uh, <laughs> he, you know, he wanted to be on the, on the radio show. So, um, but I, I did not know Chief Simmons. This is the first time uh, meeting him. So first of all, let's let Chief Simmons introduce himself and then, you know, any uh, input that you have in the last two would be great. Hey, um, good morning, good afternoon folks. Jamon Simmons, member of the Oakland Fire Department out here in Northern California. 
excellent dialogue so far. And this is in line with many of the things that I emphasize back here in my home organization and across the region. As the first gentleman was stating, Joshua, he made two, two salient comments. He talked about the IC cannot be past saturated. And we all can agree with that. As I was thinking about that comment, as that comment was being mentioned, I was thinking about Hackensack, New Jersey. All of us remember that incident. Oftentimes when that incident is discussed, we, we're discussing it from a building construction perspective, both stream construction. But one of the things that came out of that after action report was that the incident commander had missed some critical radio traffic. And once again, before I go any further, that's not to say that that's the reason why those individuals um, died at that incident. But as we talk about today, that incident commander missed some key points because he was helping advancing hose line, which is a very important skill. However, the million dollar question, should he have been doing that or someone else? And we all know the answer to that. And then, you know, I often hear this, this come up in conversation, not only on the East Coast, but also out here in the West Coast, we talk about checkbox officers, officers, ICs, company officers, chief officers. And we all agree that there has to be some flexibility there because the incident is so dynamic um, within itself. But think about it, every time we get on the airplane and hopefully that pilot, I mean, that captain and that co-pilot while we are boarding and, and if you're in first class, you're getting your wine and coffee and all that good stuff. Those two pilots, they're going through a checklist. So checklists within their self are not necessarily a bad thing. They can become a bad thing when we simply rely on a checklist, tactical worksheet, checkbox, whatever you want to call it, and not rely on the men and women who are inside of that building, the men and women who are on the Bravo, Charlie, and Delta side of that, of that building to provide us with critical information. So some of the expectations that I have of uh, incident commanders here in Oakland, company, whether it's a company officer, chief officer, number one, he or she has to be decisive. Number two, they have to have a plan and a backup plan. And both that initial plan and that backup plan has to support the incident priorities. Number three, what the company officer expects from the IC is to have a hazard management plan or risk management plan. I, I'm not a big fan of the term risk management. I'm not, definitely not a big fan of risk a lot to save a lot. And risk none to save none because what does that really tell us? But have a, have a hazard management plan. So whether you want to use that ICS 215A form and identify the hazards and identify control factors, the company officer, he or she expects the IC to have enough resources on scene to handle all of the tactical objectives. Number five, that incident commander, the expectation is that he or she is flexible, flexible in their decision making. And then number six, what well, number six and then number seven, number, number six is there has to be two-way dialogue. We use this term situational awareness a lot. And I always tell folks, if you ever want to confuse yourself in terms of what situational awareness means, is look it up. I keep it simple. Situational awareness is those verbal and visual cues that help guide your decision making. So it has to be two-way dialogue. And then last but not least, that, in, that incident commander, he or she has to quickly be able to analyze and synthesize that incident, break it down, build it up, and give some type of meaning so that an incident action plan could be developed based on that. And I think that's whether you are in Baltimore, Oakland, St. Louis, or all, all other places in between, if an incident commander can do that, it will ensure firefighter safety to its highest degree. Okay, well, I, I got stuff written down here because Chief Silvernero got me got me all wound up on a. I was getting ready to jump on my soapbox, um, but didn't do it. So, um, Brian, do you want to add some stuff in here before I before I jump on that soapbox? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because guy will be God only knows where that'll end up. Uh, I think the big thing, you know. <laughs> No, Ricky, who knows? Um, 
I think one of the things that, you know, I take away from this is obviously the training aspect of it. Uh, you know, that the fire ground is basically like our big game, right? So um, if we want to have trust, you know, Josh and, and Roger brought up some great points as company officers back when I was company officer, I thought the same things. You know, I got to be able to trust that battalion chief that he's making good decisions on my behalf. Um, he's got my back. I got his back. What he's telling me is right. And I think that all goes back to the, to the you know, to the, the idea that this is a game sport. And so, you know, just like any big game, we have to practice and it comes back down to training. And if we, as a company officer or, or a shift commander or a deputy chief, whatever, you know, everybody's got to be at that training so that everybody knows what everybody's capabilities are, right? If, if we see something going on the fire ground that you've never seen before, because you haven't been to a training in five or seven years as a chief officer, and then you're pulling a crew out and you're like, hey, what are you doing? You can't do that. And they're like, we've been doing this for 10 years. Sorry, this is your first fire you've been to in 10 years. You know, um, I see a lot of I see a lot of captains head shaking and things like that because it's probably unfortunately the reality, right? So, you know, most of the things that we see is these you know admin chiefs, and I don't want to admit to being one yet, but uh, you know, some of these admin chiefs don't get out of the office, and then all of a sudden they show up on this big fire and they're questioning things, and it's like, well, how can you question that when when God's honest truth, we've been training on it, you know, on different things. The the fire service is a dynamic sport, uh, dynamic field, if you will, whatever you call it. And so, you know, if we're going to be in command of calls as, as you know, chief officers, I think we, we owe it to the company officers that are working their asses off, uh, working their butts off, excuse me, uh, for, for the team, right, to, to be there, uh, if nothing else, than observing what they're doing, right? And I think that's a, a critical point to build that trust. Soapbox all right, is so all yours. Nah, nah, I'm going to get back because I want to go back to Josh. I mean, so Josh has had to listen to, you know, three chiefs talk now and uh give their perspective and once again you know it's it's the guy inside the building so i mean you got anything you want to add here since we josh or um <clears throat> roger had a good point making sure conditions on the inside match the conditions on the outside um i've been on both sides of that and um so it's it comes down to trust and like just very clear communication we we had a fire just last week where we had to convince some uh, officers that no, it's, it's actually safe to go in because what we were seeing on our side looked a lot better than what they were seeing on their side. And that's actually the only way we were able to get the fire out was to go back in and make things happen. Um, so trusting in the transmissions, but yes, they need to match up. I think no matter what side of the fence we're on, what some of the things we were discussing is all about that balance. Um, balance. Yes. Sometimes there's a time for the tax sheet. Sometimes we just need that free thinking person to not meddle in affairs of things. Um, yeah, the resource deployment, I'm a huge fan of part of that resource deployment is, um, maybe this is me being selfish, but nothing drives me more crazy than a unit that gets assigned in front of me when they shouldn't have been. So tracking your resources, maybe that is where the command sheet comes from. But if I get punked on a fire and I should have been just because the chief officer wasn't tracking things, it drives me up a wall. So I know it's a little down in the weeds, but man, that it gets me fired up. You know, I should have been working. Um, just seeing if I had anything else in my, uh, in my notes here. Um, oh, and then something that we got a little wrapped up in in our department, we're, we're getting a lot better with though, is that if you're going to assign a division or a group to a single officer and have them manage resources underneath them, make sure they are also in a forward position. I don't know if this is an issue elsewhere, but sometimes a division or group supervisor, they're actually going to pull back. And like, all right, I need to see what all is going on. And maybe they're on the exterior. They're not actually with their units. You need to be in the middle. You need to be forward thinking so that you can get that transmission out to that command officer. So together you can make the problem go away. Um, so yeah, if you're a lieutenant, a captain, and you get in charge of managing the division or group, make sure you're in a position where you can actually take care of those people because you're that single point of communication you should be having face-to-face -face communication. You're not somewhere on the exterior or somewhere pulled back. You know, make sure that you are, um, you know, going to get the right transmissions out. Um, man, I had a whole handful of things, but yeah, I, I think we're all pretty much on the same page. Yeah, even if we are deviating from each other, uh, that it's always balancing that between the two. You can't go hard in the paint on one side or another with this. Um, but yeah, good discussion. So, Josh, I take it you like the guy, the aid, the New York City Chiefs aid. When the chief just looks over and goes, hey, who's next up? And he already knows who's in line. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm a little biased. I was an aide for a while. So, <laughs> yeah, I got to watch those videos. That's all that you, hey, who's next up? And he looks to his aide and the aide tells him the company. So 
I guess you got to be good to the aid rather than, you know. Yeah, it's true. You got to be good to the aid. If you got a really awesome chief, they'll let that aid go to work too. So I went to some great fires and aid and I got to play. Um, man, you don't see that a whole lot anymore, but yeah. So the what I was going to get on, um, so this may leave, uh, you know, I mean, obviously Roger's been chief officer and Josh is certainly capable to be one um, and should be one in his department very soon, hopefully. That's a hint and a nudge to Josh because he'd be a great chief officer. But I want to go back to something uh, Chief Silvernell said was that, uh, you know, are you an SOP driven department or are you a command driven department? And uh, so we're going we're to go away from the, the company officers for a minute. And because I, I wanted to go on this is that, I, you know, I think that you can be both. Um, uh, I, you know, you're as I see it. And, you know, I'm not speaking for my pro, you know, my, my man. Uh, Chief Schultz is that, you know, the SOPs drive us till the chief gets there. So, you know, gets people in right positions, gets uh, hose lines and people moving into the right spots. And then once the chief gets there, you know, he takes in the whole scene. Uh, he sees what's happening, see what, you know, if we've had good conversion, you know, what problems are still outstanding, you know, you know, all the stuff that, you know, Chief Simmons was talking about, uh, then, you know, hey, we may have to deviate from, you know, the this SOP and, and go this route, or we may have to put this company here, or that company there. Is everybody in agreement or disagreements with that? Or so Chief, since you you said it, I'll let you go back to the Chief Silvernail and then we'll go back to Chief Simmons. No, Rick, I'm totally in agreement with you. You know, <clears throat> what I was referring to are those first first new companies that uh, you know have to have decisions made for them. I want those I want those decisions made right away according to the standard operating guideline. And yeah, it would be great if I could just be a, a you know, just stand in the front yard and be a, a traffic cop. But as you know, the fire ground is extremely, you know, dynamic and there has to be those audibles made. I mean, you know, you, you see football all the time with the, you know, you think you got the, the greatest play put in there, but then there's an audible because the defense changes. It's the same thing with a fire. Fires are all different. They require all different circumstances. So, yeah, the, the battalion chief or the IC has got to be able to make those changes or put the resources effectively where they're at. However, on a micromanagement type of perspective, like we're talking, put those resources where they're at, but then make the company officers allow them to make those decisions that work for that fire ground. Chief Heller or Chief Simmons? Yeah, just to um, go back and reemphasize that point there. There has to be a combination of following SOPs and SOGs equally important, taking what the incident giving you. As Chief just mentioned, using that analogy from a football team, come to a line of scrimmage, you can ready to run a play. It's going to be a pass, uh, pass play. However, the defense presents in a manner that requires you to now audible and change because that pass play is potentially not going to work. You have to take it. One of the things that I emphasize to folks is that um, – why following SOGs and SOPs is equally important. If we go back to the most recent incident, I think it was Grand Falls or Great Falls, those two fire departments up in Illinois where the firefighter died, those two organizations were fined or they were fined by OSHA. And part of the fine was that because they did not follow SOPs and SOGs. We all know that you can follow SOGs and SOPs and bad stuff still can happen. That's why it's the combination of following the SOPs and SOGs and also, if this is a fire, reading that incident. What is this building telling me? Is this building telling me that I need to be inside with two and a half, two and a quarter or two and a half inch hose line versus an inch and three quarter? Is this incident telling me that I need to have my personnel apply water from the outside only? Is this building telling me that it's okay for firefighters to be on top of that roof performing topside ventilation? Now, SOPs and SOGs are not going to provide you with that information. Going back to the comment Brian made, all this starts with training and education, creating those, those mental slides that recognition prime decision making. So when we do have a real incident, the plan is that much more effective. Okay, I wanted to go back to a company officer before I head to Chief Heller. So, Roger, you got anything you want to add on here, or you want to pass it to Chief Heller? It's up to you. Uh, I'll just add one of the other thing is with uh, what is SOP orders, ribbon command is if uh, 
not to we always say radio discipline, but I think that applies for the chief officer as well. Um, along with some of those SOPs going on, like we know what certain companies are already doing. You know what your companies, <clears throat> what companies you have. You don't have to reiterate to them at that time, <clears throat> at that moment on every instant. Okay, you know the first two truck is going to get ladders up where they need to be positioned. Now, if there's a deviation in that, you might need to tell them. But when it's every fire ground, that's just tying up time, which could be the time that somebody that's already inside needs to make that mayday or the other engines trying to get their radio message out for their second uh, second supply line or whatever the case may be. Maybe it's the uh, officer or the, the company officer in the rear trying to give a size up from the rear or possible victims. If you're just talking just to talk, when it's already something that's pre-established, you as a chief officer also need to have that radio discipline and not just force it upon the, the members and the, the company officers. Chief Heller? Well, again, I, I think we're, we're hitting a lot of the same stuff. The SOPs and SOGs are a big deal. And having everybody on that same page, understanding that this is the way we operate, why we operate, these are ex our expected results and our expected positions we plan on putting our people in. Um, I, I think one of the things that I, I ran into when I was a company officer and I try to avoid it as a chief is, uh, are we allowing our people to think and base their decisions on experience and our known resources, our known building construction, or are we so SOP, SOG driven that again, it's almost checking the box and not free thinking. And I, I've worked for chiefs that did both. And I absolutely appreciated the ones who were a bit more, uh, more understanding of free thinking, not freelancing, not doing what you feel like doing when you feel like doing it. But based on the education experience and the training that we've given our people, I don't want robots. And I don't want chiefs who treat my guys like robots. So um, I think that's a big deal. And just, and again, we talked and, and we've all said this over and over so far today is that flexibility of, we may have to drop back and punt. You know, we may have to change tactics quickly. We may, we may see things that other guys aren't seeing. I, I, I called in uh, on an interior operation one time. I told the chief, we're getting it, we're getting it. You know, give us a couple minutes. We got this thing. And he, what he was seeing from the outside was absolutely we weren't getting it. I was seeing a microcosm of the fire and when I came out, I was hot as hell about it. And then when I looked up, I went, that's why you're the chief and I'm the captain. So it, it, uh, we, we just have to give ourselves flexibility. And, and again, it comes back to that training and trust. The more they train, the more we understand what they do as company officers. And we remember where we came from, the better it's going to be when, uh, for chief officers as well. Ryan? No, I think uh, Chief Heller brings up great points, you know, from the training perspective, you know, if you have the opportunity, you know, switch roles, that's always a good perspective uh, gainer, you know, uh, let the company officer kind of run the training ground and put that chief officer back in that company officer seat, just it, it gets that gain respect of each other. Um, but I think the other part too is, you know, and Chief Silver doesn't, is, you know, I've worked with him for a long time now, he's always told me, he's like, you got promoted for a reason. And, you know, demand head on, I think we've all talked about it is, you know, you are there to make decisions. Your competency was demonstrated through the promotional process and through your, your scope of work. And so make decisions based on the conditions given to you. Yes, we have SOPs and SOGs and POMs and all those things in place that should define what we do uh, as arriving units on scene, uh, first driving engine, first driving truck, whatever that might be. But if the conditions on the scene are different than what you see as the company officer arriving first due, the first due battalion chief arriving as the incident command, whatever it is, you know, dictate that fire ground, given that that fire ground, as you guys all said, is different than the last fire ground. It's going to be different than the next fire ground. And so we have to have that, that competency and, and confidence to make those, make those calls on the fire ground. So it's great. I, I think we're all saying the same thing, you know, just different versions of saying the same thing, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's good stuff. So Josh, you know, we'll go back, you know, let's step back from, you know, uh, you know, Nathan's uh, incident and, and just go I mean, on a day to day basis on an incident, you know, not, you know, not fire. I'm not talking about firehouse stuff or, you know, any of the craziness stuff that goes on with, with personnel just on a fire ground. What is, you know, what does the chief need to provide you to help you do your job better? 
Um, man, just the day-to-day stuff, um, just pr- providing information. Like there's a lot of things, at least in our department, that get funneled from the top down. Um, whether it's little things like sometimes it's hydrants out of service or, hey, we got a crazy thing going on with this building. This whole thing's full of asbestos and then the, half the building uh, population is out. Half the citizenry is out there going somewhere else. So if this thing catches on fire while it's under repair, you got health hazards. You know, getting the information down to us is awesome. The uh, caveat to that would be when they're having their battalion meetings, um, there's a lot of things that they just need to be the funnel for or the filter for, let me say. So there's a lot of things that we can get the, um, they can get crews amped up, you know, when they're sitting around the coffee table and that's the chief's, you know, prime time to be able to filter that information and just control the hearsay. <laughs> um, I can't tell you by the time the chief gets to the next firehouse, the, the story's already grown legs and things are, you know, spreading like wildfire. Um, so, I mean, just don't play into that. Just don't play into that. Give us the information that we need. Um, filter what we don't. Because you don't need to go through every single line of your battalion minutes and whatever the state of the, the county is. But give us that information. And then um, be active. So it's really easy to sit in that office. There's a ton of administrative things that can be happening and going on. Uh, but when you hit the street and you're actually watching your crews train, Hopefully that's one of the expectations you're already put in place is they're actually getting that hands-on training. Go out there and see what they're doing. Maybe you can add a little bit to it. You can add some benefit. You can, you know, get things spun up and give people other things to think about, but knowing your crew's ability. Um, so that way, when you do hit the street is, is absolutely paramount. Um, I know that there are chiefs out there that try to get it to where it's like, Hey, I can count on all my ships, all my companies, all my crews or I need to be able to, and it's not an unreasonable expectation at the same time as a chief officer. And I can look at the chiefs that we're here with today. You know, you've got your go-to companies when things really go sideways. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent. We have the strong companies out there that can make things happen. So you need to be, I, I, excuse me, you need to be able to identify what those companies are, what they're capable of. And depending on the circumstance, they may not be the same companies. So getting out there in the street, getting out from behind that desk. Um, yeah, just be out with the crews and, and know what their capabilities are. Go ahead, Chief. What's Ricky, I was going to, Josh has totally stole what I was going to say, so thank you very much. The tying chiefs or chiefs at that level or any chiefs have got to be present. And they got to know, you know, if you're in charge of a battalion, you have to know your battalion, you have to know your cowboys, you have to know the people that are level headed, those who lack experience, because those are going to make a big difference. You know, when I call inside, they say, hey, you, you got to get out, you know, and I got that cowboy. It's like, no, no, I'm good. You know, it's like, no, get out. Or you got the level headed. You call in like, chief, I think I got this. I'm going to give you two to three minutes, you know, or the unexperienced ones. It's like, get out, you know, the. And, you know, it's all about trust. You got to trust your people. You got to know your people. You should be able as a battalion chief to understand the inflection in a voice, you know, what is desperate, what is not. And, and that's being present and being a training, like Brian had said earlier, it's all about training. That's really where the starts. And, you know, finally, I just want to make the point of predictability. Like I said, um, you know, I see should, should understand fire ground behavior. They should understand building construction. And, you know, the time to say, get out now, it, there are times to say get out now, but a lot of times you have that time to predict. I used to like giving my guys the two to three minute warning. It's like, you got two to three minutes. If I don't see a change, I'm pulling you out. So I didn't have that company officer saying, man, I'm right there. I could get it. You know, I'm giving you that opportunity. You know, if you don't get it, it's done. But you know, that I think that's what you guys like seeing. Um, but I, you know, as, as a, as a, as a company officer, that's what I like to have is that opportunity, but I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, he brings out, you know, the chief brings up an interesting point. So, um, you know, obviously knowing uh, most where, where everybody's from and, you know, in our organization, it's a, it's 500 square miles, some 49 companies. Um, uh, so I, I run a command post. If I'm the incident commander, usually I have a career battalion chief in the car with me. And that's one of the things that, you know, when we start getting these uh, weird transmissions from inside the building, you know, it's like, who is that? Do you know who that is? You know, is, are, are we are we trusting this guy? Are we not trusting that guy? Um, you know, what are we doing? But it has to be that quick conversation. 
Um, you know, recently we had a May Day uh, about two, probably probably three or four months ago, and the battalion chief had done a 360, and I was the instant commander. He comes back and literally gets in the car and says, "Get him out! Get him out now!" And there was I didn't I didn't waste three seconds of getting that out. And that's you know talking about building that trust, knowing your people, um, knowing their abilities. Now is am I, is every battalion chief going to get that? Um, trust level? No, because I, I don't know them that, you know, all of them that well. Uh, they may be young. You talk about the experience piece, um, you know, how well they operate on their fire grounds, but there's certainly those those chiefs that w- when they say it, it, it's getting done that instant without any question, you know, and, you know, after we got done, you know, uh, pulling them out and we were able to take a breath, I'm like, all right, what was going on that made you do this? So I know, you know, for this next fire or whatever, you know, what was going on back there? that made you say this? Cause you know, I was just operating on exactly what he said with that asking question. So, um, but that could go for their company officers also is, you know, when a company officer, you know, if Josh is, um, I know Josh's abilities as a firefighter and, and an officer and, and the same with as Roger, you know, if they give me any kind of um, radio transmission that it's, you know, it's hot, it's warm. And I'm going, well, if it's warm for Josh and Roger, I can't imagine what it's going to be for everybody else. Uh, cause you know, that building could be falling around them and they'll still want to be in there. Um, but, but knowing those company officers is, and you know, the battalion chiefs knowing their companies, you know, whether you're small or you're large, um, you know, having those, those people know each other. And, um, you know, as, as you get higher up in an organization, you know, as I think, you know, like even Brian or, or, you know, uh, chief Silvernail said, is it, you know, a, a, or the administrative chief, you know, that shows up, it has to be, have that trust. And those those company officers and the battalion chiefs and the assistant chiefs. So, Chief Simmons. Yes, um, I want to come back to a couple of comments that were, sure. that were made in regards to strong companies and trust and, and not trusting. You know, part of me, I like to. My left brain is very pragmatic, and my and a right brain is very uh, utopian. But my left side, pragmatic. Yes, all of us work for organizations where we have a bunch of strong companies and we have some companies that are not necessarily strong. But our job as chief officers is to make every company strong because when we arrive at Ms. Jones or Mr. Johnson's house at two o'clock in the morning for a structure fire or a hazmat incident or an MCI, every company has to be strong. So the question is, what's our role in making every company strong? Secondly, trust and not trusting. Every company officer through legitimate power has to be able to make decisions. How do we build that trust between the company and the chief officer? So now when we are in the hazard zone operating, regardless of who that individual is, he or she is, when they communicate some some critical information to me as the incident commander, I trust their decision-making. I trust their assessment. Because if we continue with, well, I trust this individual, I don't trust this individual, it puts us in a perilous situation. When we continue to foster strong companies and weak companies, it puts not only firefighters, but also citizens in a perilous situation. We have to reverse that. Every company that shows up on scene has to be strong. And as incident commanders, we have to be able to trust the information that's being communicated from us and also to us from those company officers when they're serving this division and group supervisors. One of the things I tell my company officers, when I assign you as a division or group supervisor, you have five important responsibilities. I use the acronym SPORT. You're responsible for that situation. You're responsible for the priorities that are assigned to you. You're responsible for the object, those tactical objectives that are assigned to you, those resources and that territory. Those are five important responsibilities as a division or group supervisor. And part of that, it has to be trust, and every individual and company that's operating on that floor, that division, that area, they all have to be strong. Okay. And Chief Heller, did uh, did I miss something here on this chat room? Or uh, just um, one of the things Jack Wilson said: uh, experienced IC 
along with trustworthy company officers is the key. That that's exactly right. You know, that is the key. We, and, and we have to foster that as, as G Simmons said, we have to foster that. It's the only way that we get better is, is by working together and understanding each other. And that's, that's how we get to those companies who we, we feel they're all playing on the, on, in the big leagues, you know, and we don't have to worry that one of them's only swinging at single a when we need them to be at the big league level. And I think that's, that's, you know, Jack, Jack's a very experienced guy out of Delaware. And I think he's spot on. I mean, I think, you know, uh, most of us, um, you know, obviously if anybody's watching a uh, uh, hunt day hangout on a Wednesday afternoon, obviously they're into the job and obviously the, you know, the 10 or nine or 10 of us are on here into the job. It, it just, it baffles me sometimes when I run calls and uh, you know, if you're into the job, you, you want to go to that box alarm. You want to go to the structure fire. You want to, you know, you, you want to even want to get dispatched on one. I mean, you know, depending on what your activity level is and then how we don't have a conversation, even on a pot of food or a kitchen fire, or, um, you know, we're chasing a light ballast of, um, with those company officers, you know, we, we always want to have that hot wash or after action critique for, you know, if we got a room off or two rooms off or something bigger, but, to even have them on the, you know, the, the, the insignificant call, um, once again, you know, making sure that the company officers were all aligned with what the incident commander was thinking. The incident commander was all aligned with what the company officers were doing and, you know, and, and not just going, Hey, Hey, this is our third reported structure fire tonight. We're, we're done talking about them. Is that uh, you can never give up that those, those uh, opportunities or training um, regardless of the building, even you know, I, I know for Roger and for, for Josh and obviously probably for everybody, you know, we have that that same group of uh, buildings that we run all the time. You know, we know the street really well, but um, we always need to polish ourselves up for that for when it's going to be that next fire. So, uh, Brian, I'm sorry, you're the only one who haven't hit back up here yet. So, no, I think I think everybody's pretty much hit it on the spot. So I'm not going to be, be a little bewildered to the point. All right. So, um, you know, we're, we're getting close to that time, the one hour, um, you know, Pete, uh, Pete from fire engineering will be hitting up my phone here any second. So, um, so, so with closing thoughts here, we'll start with chief Simmons and then I'll, I'll go around the room. So. I just keep mine short. It's all about that alignment and that alignment is twofold alignment in terms of people in, on in the hazard zone and then alignment of that, that instant action plan incident priorities, tactical objectives, and task level activities, they have to be in alignment. And when people are in alignment and the IEP and all facets of the IEP are in alignment, success in the hazard zone takes place. Thank you. Chief Silverdale? You know, like, like we said before, it's all about trust. Um, you know, we have to have the ability to trust our company officers, but you also have to have the ability to trust us as the incident commanders. Um, you know, it's very challenging to go from a, a company officer to that front yard a battalion chief or car, however you do it. You know, you just have to realize that your hands off now and you have to trust those to do the work ahead of you and just hopefully give them what their expectations are because it is two way. You know, we, we say we have expectations of them, but you know what? Their expectations of us are just as important. Josh? No, thanks again for having me on. A uh, quick shout out to the department. We have our Nate Flynn training days coming up, our annual training, uh, July 23rd. I'm sure that's going to be announced soon. Um, and we usually, I think we got some heavy hitters coming on to help out for that one. I'll just leave it at that. that. Um, yeah, no, I think great discussion. I think we're all largely on the same page. And um, last thing I'll leave with is uh, at the end of the day, beginning of the incident, end of the incident, you know, culture in the fire service that that chief is also the um, setting the tone uh, just for the attitude. So you're that sense of calm. So if things start going awry, you either need to reel things back in or you're the one setting the tone right off the gate in the station um, on the fire scenes. So if you can provide that sense of calm and security right from the get go, a lot of downstream issues will probably even take care of themselves. Like, hey, the chief's not spun up about this. We're probably in a good spot. So but yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, Josh, be sure to uh, send me the information. Is that all in person or are they going to do it virtual and in person? Uh, I know they're hashing out the plans now. Uh, historically, it's been virtual during pandemic, and then we try to do in person. Um, I think this year it might be a blend of the two. 
So I think Roger might know better than I would, but um, as soon as we get information, I'll be sure to share that out. I'm sorry, is Roger a heavy hitter all of a sudden or what happened? <laughs> <laughs> but now, so yes, I mean, it, you know, I, I think that's the new way anyways, is that virtual stuff is, I mean, even Andrew Fredericks has, has got the hybrid again, this coming up in 2022 or 2023, they're, they're doing that. So it'd be 23 because I guess they're back in Alexandria. So um, I think they're doing a hybrid version of that also. So, um, so if you get that information to us, we'll get it out on our social media. And I'm sure the uh, fire service instructors will do the same. So get that thing well attended as it always is. So uh, Roger, heavy hitter, apparently. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not the one he's referring to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you might know a couple of the people. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I would say just uh, no matter your rank, just because you took the, the rank position, whether it be chief officer or all company officer or whatever does doesn't automatically make you the the only smart one in the room so sometimes we all need to just check our egos no matter what our rank is or whatnot understand build that trust and that mutual respect understand who you have around you and working for you and uh use that to the best of uh the instant that we have a hand and the service citizens brian yeah, I just go back to the idea of the sport. You know, you look at any winning team, you know, uh, practice how he's supposed to coach on the field. And so, you know, if we're going to be the uh, the guy coaching the troops and on the on the fire ground, if you will, uh, we've got to be there at the trainings too. And so I think that's critically important. And Chief Heller. Yep, I appreciate it, guys. I, I just think, you know, the relationships between the company officers and the chief officers, uh, they're just as important as the as the comp the officer and the fireman's relationship, so it, it all builds on that trust as we go forward. And uh, lastly, hey, congratulations to Traditions with with Dan Shaw getting the promotion, giving it a great keynote, and uh, and Doug's keynote was absolutely fantastic. So uh, congratulations, guys, you really earned that. Yeah, I got to uh, you know since Doug uh, couldn't make it today, so we get to make fun of him. You know, he was doing this practice for his big keynote. And Brian, you might want to pay attention to this. So the very first day he was doing the Ricky Bobby thing, like he didn't know what to do with his hands or, or anything like that. So he was grabbing the microphone. So it was good to have good practice. But he knocked it out of the park on Tuesday. Uh, couldn't ask anything better. Uh, paid good homage to his to his father, um, you know, who was a, a longtime uh, FDNY veteran. So, but, you know, I guess to just kind of close it up is that obviously, you know, Reiterate, you know, it, it isn't just, you know, Chief Heller, you know, Chief Silvernail, Chief Simmons, myself and Brian, who are constantly going to FDIC, been going for decades. Uh, we need uh, new blood. Um, you know, I'm not the, the guy that's riding the right front seat anymore um, or, you know, pushing down hallways. So we need the Rogers and the Joshes and uh, people that are even below Josh and Roger. You know, they're all firefighters to, to, to give us their perspective, uh, to write articles, um, you know, what happens in Northern California is vastly different than what happens in Baltimore City, but there's a common thread in there somewhere. Um, and, you know, we, we learn a lot from that, you know, the Oakland, the Stocktons, and, you know, they obviously have great uh, videos that come out and teach us all about, you know, a good aggressive fire attack and a good managed fire department. And, hey, we can use some of that on the East Coast. And, you know, so please get out there and don't be afraid to send something to them. Um, you'd be amazed. Uh, um, how easy it is to get in the magazine and you get good editing. You don't have to be right. Good. I mean, I write run on sentences all day long and Diane just puts commas in there for me. So it's a great thing. So, um, but you know, once again, you, my, I just want to read it that company officer. Um, I just can't reiterate how important that position is, how trusted they have to be, how, um, we have to give them every bit of training that we possibly can. And then also have that interaction on the fire ground. Um, even when it's not a big call to make sure that we're on the same page all the time, they're understanding what I as an incident commander want. And then I have to understand what they need from me to help them inside the building. So that's kind of what I wanted to get out today. I know we got off on a, a little bit of a thread, but I think it was all good all, you know, all in all. So, so on behalf of uh, Clarion events group and fire engineering, uh, we want to thank you for hanging out with us on fire engineering hump day hangout. Thanks to Bobby Halton and Diane in the group and, Thanks to everybody that was on today. Uh, this is the biggest group we've had in a long time. And I appreciate it. everybody's all pumped up from FDIC. So everybody wants to, to talk fire. So, but uh, I appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a great day. And uh, 
as always, stay safe out there.